happy second day of school. Okay, a couple of things. What? The way we're going to roll this semester, and by that I mean like for the first three days, because we're going to try this, and if I hate it, we'll move to the different plan, is we're going to put the slides up here. Hopefully I can figure out how to turn this projector off, but we all watched me struggle with the upside down zoom, so clearly I've turned into an ancient human. So the other thing is, I am going to record this lecture, which means if you ask a question, the people someday of the virtual internet might hear it. I'm not, well, I don't know any of your names <clears throat> yet, so I'm not going to call you by name, but it turns out that that cord doesn't actually have internet on it, so I can't actually just live stream the course, because I don't know. This will be here. I'm going to give this a go, so if you miss it, it will go up on my YouTube channel. That's basically all that's going to happen. If you watch the recording, it turns out there aren't any slides, because that was never going to work anyway. Slides will be here. I will write on this board. If you are in one of the, like, one seat where you can't actually see this part of the board, there are lots of other options for that. Okay, so today, the first reminder is to register for Alex. I checked briefly moments ago. We've got about 45 out of 65. So there's about 20 of you who haven't done it yet. I saw someone email me like as I walked to my three o'clock class. If that was you, I will get back to you. It just, I was like, ooh, that's gonna take more time than I have. So I teach Gen Chem 1 right before this, so in the moments before, I'm not always the most coherent. Or if you email me between 3 and 4.15, I will not see it. Alex, your first assignment is due on Saturday at 11.59 p.m. That is to basically complete all of the prerequisite knowledge, which is math. It's only math. No, almost no chemistry. In that, it's going to ask you to divide things, multiply things, think about canceling units. This is when you take that prerequisite knowledge check and hopefully test out of 80 to 90% of this. If you're struggling, you have issues, send me an email. We'll try to set up a Zoom this week if we need to. I'm not available on Saturday, just because like it's Saturday. If you have a crisis, send me an email and I will try to see it, but I don't make any promises. Your next assignment will be due on Monday. That assignment is going to cover anything we learned this week. And I use air quotes for a really specific reason. On Monday, we didn't learn anything. I told you about the class. We didn't talk about chemistry. So your objectives are only going to cover what we learned this week. So the following week, so Monday, Labor Day Monday, that assessment will be over what we learned last, like next week. Does that make sense? So you have objectives due Saturday night and on Monday. On Friday, I'm going to start sending emails. Hi, you didn't sign in for Alex. And then I will continue to email you once a week until you get to it. Nobody wants to be that person. I don't like being that person. But I find great joy in getting 100% compliance. So it's happening one way or the other. If you have questions or you can't get to it, please let me know. This QR code is for the SI survey. If you have not taken it, you can bust out your cell phone now. You can open the camera app, focus on this, and it will directly bring you to the link. That's how QR codes work now, right? You can take that if you've already taken it. You don't have to take it again. If you don't take the survey and none of the SI times work for you, I'm not going to say too bad, so sad, because that would be mean. But it's going to be really hard for us to think about how they don't meet your needs if you don't tell us what they are. More than likely, the sessions are Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Because my class runs from 3 to 6. That, that's why. So the SI, she's not here today, is combined with my 3 o'clock section. So I tell you this, because in here, there's low density population. If you go to that, you're going to be like, oh my god, where did you come from? You never come to school. They're just strangers in a different class. Just, y'all don't. I feel like I'm not funny, and that's a lie, because I know I'm funny. So today we're going to talk about chapter one. We will get 99% of the way through that. We will start chapter two on Monday. We will probably, we're going to try to finish chapter two next week. Chapters one and two are a lot of 
in, as they are in most courses, basic info. Chapter three is like the meat and the potatoes of the first third of the course. I would rather move faster through some of this and have more time to do 900 examples as we move forward. Is anyone having, does anyone have any questions on how to register for Alex? I do yeah. have a question about Alex. Yeah. So what if you do like the 30 questions, like are you done with the pre prerequisite knowledge exam or is, like, is there more to the assignment too? So the question is once you do the prerequisite, are you done or is there more? When you sign into Alex on that front page where it's like, welcome, and then your name, and then it kind of like spins around. On the next page, it should be like a hi, and on the left, there's a couple of buttons. If the button says continue your path, you still have work to do. If it says work ahead, review, something else, you are done. If you get to the point where you're like, I don't really know if I'm done or not, send me an email. It's really easy for me to like pop in and see. What you'll notice is when you get to the end, it will basically, it will not throw confetti, but it will be like, congratulations, you completed this week's objectives. Alex will tell you. The problem is it tells you a lot of things sometimes, and so it can get lost in the, you completed the objective versus, so if, you think about Alex, it has like that pie thing. So you can complete the sliver of the pie, which means nothing, and not have finished this week's objectives. If at any point you're like, I did all this work, am I done yet? You can send me an email and I will literally look at it and email back and be like, yes, no, keep working. Because that's the last thing I want you guys to do is to be like, well, I thought I was done. Good question. Any other questions? So if you have not opted out of the fall at, open at, whatever that shenanigans is, and the way you opt out is apparently you, you may have to do that before you sign up for Alex. It should be cheaper to do the fall at access than it is to buy it on your credit card. I tend to try to be pretty budget conscious. I'm not always sure that like a $6 budget change is like a big deal. So it's not like it's $20 versus $400, which I wish it was that way, but like it's not. So if you opt out of that, you can put in a credit card or buy your Alex code somewhere else. It used to be that it was like 60-ish if you did it via credit card, 90 at the bookstore. It should be in the 50s, but inflation is here. And so I have no idea how much it is charging you. So someone can email me that information if you know. If you have questions, it should be, click the link, register, it charges your account. It should be super, we're trying to make this as easy as possible. This is the first time we've done this this way. So if you have tried it and you're like, I hate this, please let me know. Yeah. Uh, it cost me $61. 61? 61. Not bad. So, this is a good question. You might have emailed me about this. Here's how I think that, this is how they explained it to me, which, to be clear, is not always the way it really works in adult life. The idea is that you would basically, when you sign in, on some end that is not between what I see or what you see, it basically adds a charge to your, like, student bill. So if you were to sign in and ask, like, how much money do I owe you an app? Somewhere on that very long list of charges, which has a bunch of things that don't make any sense. I didn't write that part. Somewhere it should say like Jen Kim and Alex, and then a $61. I, I think. But if, as long as I'm in, it's like the full If you're in, you should be good to go. If it does something weird and you get booted out, send me an email and we'll fix it. I was going to say, for me, they just sent me an email saying for the fall and accent, it just said, like, congratulations, you're registered. It said, if you want to opt out just to create an account, but it was already, if you look at your UNS bill, it just said, like, I don't know what it was. Then you say, like, so you should, I need to click on it and see all of them. I have, like, three classes. They did that for us. So you can click on it and see 
Yeah, which feels kind of like an upcharge, like you went and you got a new phone and then you got a $700 bill and you're like, I just thought it was going to be the same price. So realistically, if you guys think this is the absolute worst, I will never do it again. I like anything that makes my life easy, except when I get my credit card bill and I'm like, oh my God, I added to cart and one click ordered too many things. Um, but that's, that's my own personal life issues. Uh, so if you don't like it, please let me know. If you're like, this was great, I'd also take that feedback as well. <coughs> Any other issues, concerns? Today we're gonna to talk about some things that make Alex super irritating. And I'm gonna to try to give you as many helpful hints because otherwise you're gonna email me and tell me why you hate it. And that's fair. Any other questions? Yeah. That is something different. So it should be in the Alex module on Canvas, but there's always a chance that I put the wrong one in there. And so I will double check on that. Um, as a elder millennial, I think calling tech support is the worst because tech support is almost always the worst. You call them, you wait online, and then someone says, do you wanna restart? And you're like, Okay, no, I want to skip steps one through 12. I'm telling you it won't work. I've restarted, I've unplugged. I shook it upside down seven times. I did all those. I know how to use Google. Alex is the only place where I will tell you to call tech support and I mean it. When I have technological issues with Alex, because every now and again it like has a meltdown, or I have unlinked my course and my canvas before and it's like surgery to put them back together, you will call, you will wait less than 10 minutes, a human will answer the phone, you don't have to say operator 42 times, and they will help you. You should call them if your account's on link. So basically you click the button and it's like, we don't know you. Or if somehow you get, so the only time it was really a problem is I had um, two friends who somehow linked student A to student B's homework. <laughs> and they were like, I don't know, like it was a whole thing and I was like, I don't even know how to fix it. We called tech support in 10 minutes, it was like fixed and like simply done. So they are super helpful. The 1-800 number, cause they don't have a like texting version of this, which would be my preference, um, is in the Alex module. If you need something, you can like send me an email first. Sometimes I know how to fix it. If I don't, I will say, try this. And then I will copy our sales rep on that. And she is, she will make it happen, even if that means that you and she have to like sit in a Zoom room together and like figure it out, but it'll work. So keep me updated if you have struggles with Alex. Hopefully we will not have struggles. Hopefully it'll be pretty seamless. But any other questions, concerns, choices, life? I'm going to turn off some of these lights because they're making me sweat. I'm going to mess up and I'm going to turn off all the lights because that's how life works. So if you're afraid of the dark, hang tight, get your phone out. That wasn't exactly what I wanted. I don't actually know what all these do. Hold please. Oh, oh my God, no. This is so fun, I love my life. Okay, we'll sweat. I will put in a ticket. It looks like the lights in the back never light up, which means when you take an exam, you may wanna move closer so that you can in fact actually see the paper. If that if that's something you like, I'm not gonna. I might need this out, but most likely you're gonna get. So today we're gonna talk about chapter one, and chapter one is a skill building exercise. Mostly, uh, we're gonna talk about how we're gonna do stuff all semester long. The issue with chapter one, maybe not the issue, is some of the things that the skills we're gonna use 
You don't have enough knowledge to use them yet, so we're going to try to teach it to you in weird ways. In particular, dimensional analysis, where we're going to take unit one and convert to something else. When we get to chapter three, we're going to do that a lot using gram and moles and other things. But you might be like, oh my god, I don't know what a gram is, and I don't know what a mole is. It's okay. We haven't gotten there yet. So today we're going to talk about it in terms of units that you have in class seen. What I'm saying is there are parts of these types of questions where we're never going to see them again. We're going to see it here. We're going to see it on mini exam one. And I'm never going to ask you to convert miles per hour to meters per second. Because in a minute, or not in a minute, in like 10 days, we're going to use it for real in chemistry, and that will work better. So today, what we're going to talk about is basically what's happening. These are the subsections of the book. We briefly talked about one through four on Monday, basically, and I was like, there's three states of matter, because that's all that's in there. We're going to talk about 5.6 through, no, 1.5 through 1.7. Most of the rest of the book, like the slides, don't correspond exactly with the book, because I realized that sometimes the book makes bad choices. So I have put them in a blender, shaken them up, stirred, made better arrangements, so I will keep you updated as we do that. So units of measurement. Measurement means we're going to measure something. If I tell you that I have 912 monies, you're like, that's cute. Do you have 912 dollars, pennies, nickels, yen, monopoly money? How many monies? And the reason you don't know is because I didn't give you a unit. If I said I have 912 cents, they're like, okay, I don't think about that way, but that's like $9. If I said 912 yen, I don't actually know how many dollars that is. I would have to Google using a Google currency calculator. But the point is, that is a unit that you can actually use. Monies is not. So when we think about properties of chemicals, people like to talk about it's red, it's yellow, it's chalky. Those are relatively subjective. Subjective means your opinion on a color might not be the same as mine. Now, some colors we all know, right? Like white is a color, paper is sometimes white. But if we start to talk about pink, I as a pink aficionado may have a very different definition of pink than you in your pink versions. So we're gonna start to build frameworks for how we're going to think about different chemical properties. And we're going to do that by getting units, and we're going to do that by using significant figures. So in 1960, at the international meeting, the General Conference on Weights and Measures, scientists all get together, and they agreed on base units. So what this is, here in the United States, we still use Fahrenheit. And everywhere else in the world, okay, everywhere is a little strong. In most everywhere else in the world, they use Celsius. Celsius is how a lot of people define temperature. We are different. But it used to be that way about everything. People just made up their own units. I guess that's how you could get famous, right? Like, I just want to have the Malcolm unit. And I guess if you publish it, it's true. Maybe I should go back to that life. But the idea is, they came together and they were like, we are all going to use these terms, and these terms mean these things. People still do this. This meeting still occurs. It has happened in like different fields where people get together and are like, okay, let's all call the same thing the same thing. So this is a pretty common scientific thing. So we agreed on seven units. Here, I'm going to show you three. Length, we're going to use meters. Here in the U.S., we use inches, feet, miles, and the rest of the world, they use meters. I'm not saying the US does stuff different, but we do in a lot of ways. We're gonna use mass, so if you were to weigh something, people tend to use kilograms. In Gen Chem, we're almost always gonna use grams. Basically, if I ask for the weight of something, it will be in grams, and you're gonna put it back in grams, most of the time, in temperature. So, this temperature, So, scientists 
scientific measurements tend to be in Kelvin. Most of the time, as in like 99% of the time, I'm going to give you a Celsius value. I'm pretty much never going to give it to you in Fahrenheit, ever. So we will use this equation. Shortly, I'm going to tell you to memorize some things. Equations are not those things. Equations will come on an equation sheet. I will post from last year the final equation sheet. So you can kind of see what it'll look like at the end. Every equation that you need and every conversion factor that you need will be in this information for any graded assessment. That is to say, if I, who's that? It wasn't mine. I don't know. We'll figure it out. So if you have a value of Celsius you need to convert to Kelvin, you will use this equation. This equation, along with many, many, many others, will be found in your equation sheet. Please don't memorize this. The things I want you to memorize, I will tell you. Questions? Yeah. So the question is, where did Kelvin come from, essentially? So on the next to last day of class, or thereabouts, we're going to actually talk about briefly where it comes from is at Kelvin. It is if you compress a gas, there is no additional movement. So when we think about, maybe we don't think about, I think about, every bond has like a little wiggle. And sometimes the hotter it gets, the more wiggly they are. At zero Kelvin, which is basically negative 273 degrees Celsius. So Lord Kelvin did this calculation. I think they decided to name it after him where it's like there is no movement. So that's just the conversion between those two. It feels a long way to say like it's just because. Um, but Lord Kelvin's calculations. Actually, I think he's a Lord. My friend refers to him as Lord Kelvin. He might be lying to me. He might just be Sir Kelvin. Um, but he basically figured out at negative 273 degrees Celsius. And then I think they went back and made a new scale with that zero value. And to date, I think they've been able to cool stuff down to like two or three Kelvin in some of the super cooling centers. Other Any other questions? So numerical prefixes. Today, if I tell you I have $1 million, most of us can think through how many commas are in that number. But that's because we think about money and there are millionaires and billionaires and we kind of, they show us that number on like CNN or whatever news organization you use. When we start to think about grants, I'm not gonna tell you, like I weighed out 600 million grams. Like, that's, I, I can't even think about that. But people will start to use these prefixes. Like, I have five kilograms, which is 5,000 grams. So a numerical prefix, and we'll see a lot of these where scientists just decide, I want to call it something else. So these basically take the ability to take one million grams, convert it into scientific notation, or we can use one megagram. So, oops. One million equals one times 10 to the sixth grams, or it equals one, this is a capital M, and it is a mega. So you've probably heard of centimeters, or kilograms, or milliliters, People don't tend to talk about megagrams. Mega is kind of one that's in there but not used all that often. Some of the smaller ones are. So you are required to know if I give you, so if I give you Zepto, I will tell you what it is. Anything not in here, I will tell you. So you need to know if I say that there are seven kilograms, how many grams is that? You need to know how to get there. I will show you several different ways to use those calculations. A lot of you, maybe not a lot, some of you will write basically all of these letters in a row and move the decimal places around. 
That works sometimes. But when it doesn't, it goes wrong in a huge way. So what I'm going to end up showing you is ways to think about it outside of just that information. So if we have 112 nanometers, so in chapter six, we're going to talk about length. So 112 nanometers, and I want to go to meters. So you can see in this table that nanometer is 1 times 10 to the negative ninth. So you could basically say, okay, 112 nanometers is 112 times 10 to the negative ninth meters. You could kind of try to call that a day. It would kind of be a cop out. It would definitely be a minus one, minus two kind of situation if we're not actually using scientific notation. Or we know that we want to go to one meter. And we can use one times 10 to the ninth nanometers in one meter. Because in one meter, there are 1 times 10 to the 9th nanometers. Or 1 nanometer is equal 1 times 10 to the negative 9th meters. I'm going to be really honest. I will almost never use a negative exponent. You know, like, but why, Dr. Malcolm? They're so pretty. Uh, it turns out that when I get nervous, I do this on my paper. And so sometimes I have a hard time knowing, is that a negative exponent or did I just like drop my pen funny? I like positive exponents. I don't want to say it's because I'm a positive person, but like you can make that argument. However you want to use those, whether you want to use this conversion or this conversion, you're going to get the same answer when you plug it into your calculator. We are going to use exponents like this a lot this semester. You need to know what these are. Outside of that box, you don't need to know. If I give you something outside of that, like a peta or a tera, I'm going to tell you, like, one terabyte is X number of bytes. Questions? So we've talked about the standard units, and there are some derived units. A derived unit is basically one or more standard units mixed together. We will use volume, which is length times width times height in a lot of cases, or density, which is how heavy something is. All of the rest of these other standard unit or derived units, you will see at. in other courses. We're not going to use a lot of them in here. It's just showing you what's out there. Most of the time, no, almost 100% of the time, and I say almost because I can't think of anything, I'm going to tell you, please give me your answer in this unit. I don't like guessing. I think it's a cop out. I'm going to tell you, convert this number to that unit. Give me your answer in this unit. So as long as you know what those units are, we'll be able to figure that out. So volume. I tend to think about volume in terms of liquids. How much water have I had today? How many ounces are in this giant coffee that I drank for breakfast? How many milliliters are in this Diet Coke? How many milliliters are in this bottle of wine? Whatever it might be in your life. Most of us don't think about volume in terms of solid objects. I have never picked up my computer and wondered, what is the volume of this? Unless I'm trying to fit it in a box. When we think about volumes of solids, it tends to be Tetris, which is kind of volumes. Or occasionally, if you're flying on a plane and they tell you, you may have a bag this big and it will fit here. That's really the only time I think about volumes. So when we think about volumes of a liquid, it's pretty simple. How many milliliters are in there? So in volume, One milliliter is equal to one cubic centimeter. This is a pretty standard definition. A lot of times it'll ask you like, hey, can you convert this to that? And it'll start in cubic centimeter and it'll move to milliliters pretty seamlessly. When we think about a solid, if it is something other than a cube or a rectangle, 
I will provide you an equation. I don't really know why I would ask you to calculate the volume of a like, cylinder, but if I did, I'll give you that information. Just so we're clear, I cannot give you that equation today, so I'm not going to expect you to know that either. So, for an example, we have our little fishy tank with our tiny cute fish in it. So, what is the volume of a fish tank with a height of 11.3 centimeters, a width of 8.2 centimeters, and a length, <coughs> nope, a length of 1.4, not, nope, 0.149 meters. Whew. So, in this case, I'm going to draw a mediocre schematic of this fish tank, mostly so that I know which way things are oriented. So in this case, we have 0 0.149 meters, 8.2 centimeters, and 11.3 centimeters. All of these, we're going to do length times width times height, but we kind of need them all to be in the same unit. So I'm going to choose, since we have two centimeters, to take our 0.149 meters, move that into centimeters, And one meter, they're 100 centimeters, which is going to make it 14.9 centimeters. From here, we're going to multiply those three values together. 11.3 centimeters times 8.2 centimeters times 14.9 centimeters. When you plug this into your calculator, you should get... 1380.634 cubic centimeters. In our next section, we're going to talk about significant figures. So I'm going to give you the answer using sig figs so that if you were to look back at your notes, you would be like, oh my God, it's just because we hadn't gotten to that. So in this one half second of life, you could have not used sig figs. Starting eight minutes from now, we're always going to use sig figs. Just so we're all clear, that's how life rolls. we got to start somewhere. So here, the number of sig figs would be two. So that would be... Fourteen hundred cubic centimeters. I think. What questions do we have about this calculation? So, density. Density is a measurement of how heavy something is per volume. A good example of this would be pre-pandemic days when I flew. I would go to the little lady at the Southwest check-in, and I would hand her my bag, and she would make me put it on the scale, and humiliatingly, she would add on the heavy tag because it didn't matter how big my bag was. It was this close to the weight limit. I like to bring shoes. It's fine. It's just my thing. But you and I might have the same suitcase. And if you packed pillows, it would weigh less than mine full of jeans, shoes, whatever else I put in there. Seems like a lot of things now looking back. But the idea is the two suitcases have different weights. So they're going to have different densities because it is a measurement of how tightly packed this stuff is in said container. So density is equal to the mass per volume. In Gen Chem 1, it is almost always, as in like 105% of the time, going to be grams per milliliter or grams per cubic centimeter, but one milliliter and one cubic centimeter backwards, those are the same value. So a density of five grams per mil is also five grams per cubic centimeter. So we're almost always gonna think about it that way. But the density 
let's say someone give us the ability to know more information about our sample. So here are two ways that we could use density in a calculation. First example, what is the density of mercury if 1.00 times 10 to the second grams occupy 7.36 cubic centimeters? take our density equals mass divided by volume, which is 1.00 times 10 to the second grams divided by our 7.36 cubic centimeters, which gives us 13.6 grams per cubic centimeter or grams per mil. What questions do we have about this calculation? So if we look at the second example, this says calculate the volume of 65 grams of methanol if the density is 0.791 grams per mil. So more, a lot of times in lab, we're going to ask you guys to calculate density where you weigh something and calculate the volume and do that. In lecture, I'm going to ask you to use the density, to use it as a tool, not to come up with the density. So in this case, we can rearrange the equation. If density equals mass over volume, the volume equals the mass over the density. So we can take our value, our mass, of 65.0 grams, and we're going to divide by the density of 0 0.791 grams in one milliliter. And that's going to give us 82.2 .2 milliliters. Now, I said divide. And what I did is I flipped the density over and separated the units so that later, when we need to use the density in a conversion, we kind of have already seen that. Basically, grams per mil is that if you have one mil of this substance, this is how many grams it weighs. So you can basically just take them apart and set them up this way. What questions do we have about this calculation? Yeah? So with the 1 divided by 0 0.79, that's times by 65, right? And that will be 82.2? So 65 grams times 1 mil divided by 0.71, 791. So for the next few minutes, we're going to talk about everyone's least favorite discussion. Significant figures or significant digits. So significant figures slash digits, those terms are interchangeable. I will almost always say sig figs because I always have. But the idea is it's going to give us information about how accurate our measurement is. Accuracy is important. We want to know exactly how much of anything we have. So when you collect a measurement, you kind of get one of two choices. If you collect it multiple times, you're going to be accurate in that you hit the target in the center every time. You can be precise, which would be what we would call in my research lab a systemic error. If your scale was kind of broken and it was just off by five pounds, in the good way down or the bad way up, whichever way works for you, you would know that if it gave you a weight, you should just subtract five pounds and that's what you actually weigh. Or you could buy a new scale, whatever works for you. So you can be precise but getting the wrong answer because there is a mistake in what you're doing. So if you go to the grocery store and you get six bananas, I'm not really sure they'd be a half a pound, but so there's a couple of different types of scales. You can have a digital scale that basically reads out, you have 0 0.532 pounds. Or they have a basket scale where it's got the little lever that goes like this 
and it doesn't feel super accurate? It doesn't feel super accurate because some part of that is your interpretation. 99% of the time in 2021 or in the future, we do not have guessing scales anymore. If you use a thermometer for yourself, let me say this this way. When I was a kid, my mom had one that you held under your tongue for like eight years, and then she guessed. She looked at it and was like, I think it's approximately that you maybe have a feeder. The thermometer I bought is color-coded. It has a number, but it's green if you're healthy and red if you have a fever. I don't even have to think about what the numbers mean. It's great. So some of the interpretation parts of this, I'm not saying have phased out, but we don't encounter that the same way that we did 20 years ago when you would go to the doctor's office and you would stand and they would like tick, 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 tick the scale across, right? I don't know, none of my doctor's office have those anymore. Maybe mine are the better kind, but we've moved to the digital scale where it just gives you a number and you're like, ugh, which is my own personal life. So the measurements we're gonna think about in lab, no, in lab, you're gonna take measurements. There might be some inaccuracy. And here, all the numbers I give you came from a digital scale. All the numbers are important. So when we think about things you have to read off, that's where the uncertainty comes from. That really only matters with significant figures. We're gonna talk about in here how to use significant figures to get the right answer. In lab, you're gonna talk about how to make sure that you have the right number. So the point of this is we wanna make sure when we calculate something, we're getting the right number of accuracy or the right amount. So significant figures. If you have to read and guess the numbers, the last number is the estimated place. If you get on a digital scale and it says 122.3, all of those numbers are that. I had a scale that went like this. So I just guessed. I always just deducted a little, right? That's why it was wrong. Because I looked at it and said, you're trash. Let's deduce, you know, take a little away. So in this case, we're going to only see accurate numbers. So the thing is, what we want to do is determine the number of significant figures so that we can use them in our calculations. So, significant figures, in my opinion, in chemistry, they get a little wonky. When we think about money, everybody likes, maybe not everybody, I like to have money. I do not want to not have money. So if I have this If I have this many monies, <coughs> there's no decimal point in this value. Typically, by default, the decimal place goes at the end. And that's a lot of money. Maybe not for you. It will be for me. So the question becomes, if we put the decimal here, these values at the end become significant. If, so if we put it here, those are significant. These are not significant. If we put the decimal place here, I have one cent and a bunch of change. So the significant figures tell, look, I'll be honest, you cannot have one and some change cents. You either have one penny or two, period, right? We know that to be true, even though sometimes if you divide this by that, it could give you something not in a real sense. These three up here are never going to be significant, ever, because they don't change the value. Down here, if there's a decimal place, they are significant. If there is no decimal place, these three values become non-significant. That basically means that you rounded, in this case for monies, to the closest thousand. I don't know why you would do that. You would have to have a lot of money to be like, yes, it's appropriate for me to round to the clear, nearest thousand. So, Sigfigs and Alex are 
kind of like this, and then sometimes they get a little crazy. Here's what I mean. If we look at the number 102, how many significant figures are in this value? I hear a few murmurs of threes. I see a few fingers. Three. I, I concur. Typically, if I were to have the value 10, and I wanted to indicate that it had significance, but not a third digit, I would put a decimal point right here. And then you would say, all right, this snap value now has two sig figs. Most people, myself included, probably wouldn't need to put a decimal point at the end of 102 to indicate that that has three significant figures. Alex would like you to do that. And you're like, oh, well, that's weird. It's true, it is. On an exam that I'm gonna grade, you don't need to put that. You, you don't. I don't know why Alex likes that. It's just their jam, that's their thing. The other thing is, they're really, really big into scientific notation, like a lot. So for 102, it would actually sometimes prefer for you to put 1.02 times 10 to the second. It might take either one, but it will definitely ask for a decimal point at the end. It's just its thing. I would have accepted, I will accept either one of these, or the one with no decimal point. Because I don't, I can use logic, but it, it doesn't, that's its own thing. So the number of significant figures is important to tell us what our calculation should look like at the end. Hmm, we have some examples. <coughs> For the first one, 0 0.0203, how many significant figures? Three. So the two zeros at the beginning are insignificant because they're at the beginning. For the second one, how many significant figures does that value have? Woo. It only has one because it doesn't have a decimal place at the end. So I would like to give you a small Malcolm promise. You may be like, oh, all right, lady. I think it's really hard if it's 200 and then a decimal point to know, is that a period like she got to the end of a sentence? Is it that she can't type and just like sprinkles periods everywhere? Or if it's printed material, did a random dot just appear from the internet? Well, like wherever it came from. So if I wanted you to use this value, I will either say 2SF or 2 sig figs. Or it turns out it's just easier for me to go 10.0. So if you are taking a written assessment in here and you're like, is this a typo or not? Please ask. I'll tell you. It's not meant to be a guessing game. Guessing is for like horseshoes. Yes. So I would just give you an extra sig fig. Or it will tell you, like, using X number of sig figs, please do the following calculation. Uh, Alex will do the same. It will say, like, use this many or that many. So, say that. It's one sig fig. And the one at the bottom, I think, is five, if that's how many numbers are in there. There are six numbers, so there are six. All of those values are significant, however many there are. So, the reason we want to know how many there are is so that we know how many should be in the answer. We're going to talk about multiplication and division first. Of all the values that you multiply and divide, the one with the fewest number of sig figs determines how many are in the answer. That's super easy to figure out. Addition and subtraction, it turns out, is slightly more complicated because it isn't the total number of sig figs. It's the number of places after the decimal. So if one has five places and one has two, your answer should have two after the decimal place. So Alex is gonna ask you, how many sig figs will be in the answer? How many decimal places will be in the answer? And sometimes it'll ask, like, what would the answer of this calculation be? When we look at addition and subtraction, the 
sig figs is controlled by the ones after the decimal point. So if you added 9 and 8, with some stuff at the end, that would be 17 plus some stuff. You would end up with two significant figures before the decimal point, right? So you would increase your number of sig figs because you added them together. You wouldn't take 8 plus 9 and get 20 to keep it at one sig fig. I mean, you could. It's not very logical, but you could. More often than not, you should plug all of this in your calculator. Are you adding them or subtracting or multiplying? If you're subtracting, my recommendation would be to line up your decimal points, and we'll do an example in the middle in a minute. Whatever is the it's the least number of decimal points. Is this the one out of the lab where it's like 2 minus something? No, it's okay. That one's always tricky. If it is 2 minus something else, and that one has like a 2 decimal point, your final answer can't have any decimal places. So some other things we want to think about. Rounding. There is more than one way to round. I use what I call traditional rounding. Five and up, round up, four and down, round down. You round the next position. So if you want to round this value, so if this is your last sig fig, this value counts. You, you don't get to start at the end and like roll your rounding up all the way. If you like to do it, you just can't. It's whatever the next place is. Exponents. I will never ask you to add or subtract to exponents and figure out the significant figures because it's actually super hard. And I get it wrong about 95% of the time. So when you do that, you need to make sure they're all in the same decimal place, the same rules apply. For exponents, we are going to multiply and divide them a lot. The number of values that do not include your exponents. So this value has three sig figs. If you multiplied it by something with also, also three sig figs, it would have three. Exponent math is hard. Please use a calculator. If you don't know how to put exponents into your calculator, we'll talk about that every time we do it. Don't try to do it by hand. You can add them together. It doesn't always work. Or you can divide, subtract them. Just put it in your calculator. It will work 100% of the time, provided, big caveat, star here, that you know how to enter the exponents into your calculator. We'll talk about how you do that. Maybe next week when we start using exponents, but we'll get to that. Questions? So we have some examples. So first, we have a student who's gonna weigh out two things, two samples. They are 21.8 grams and 1.297 grams. So I prefer 21.8 and 1.297. If you're doing it by hand, which I really just pretty much told you I don't ever do it by hand, the thing is, we know that this 8 controls how many significant figures we can have in our answer. So when you plug this into your calculator, you get 23.097. So we need to round to this place. So the one after that is a 9, which means it's going to round up. So our final answer with sig figs is 23. 0.1 grams. What questions do we have, if any, about this calculation? So for the second question, 
it asks us to calculate the volume of a box with the following measurements. 15.5 centimeters, 27.3 centimeters, and 5.4 centimeters. If you have a calculator out, go ahead and plug that in while I write it out. many significant figures should my answer have? Two. Two. So in this case, if we got 2,285.01 cubic centimeters, what should our final answer be? 2,300. So I will take 2,300 cubic centimeters. Alex might take it. It might force you 2.3 times 10 to the third cubic centimeters. And if you're like, I hate scientific notation. I wish I could have a refresher. Your prerequisite knowledge will give you a lovely refresher on how to reuse exponents in terms of creating scientific notations. Questions about sig figs, the use of sig figs, Life with sig figs. Yeah. Like you're gonna add and you're gonna multiply and all that. So one is super annoying, TBH. Two, you'll end up trying to do so you'll step through the calculation and pause and assess your significant figures after each unique mathematical situation. That's like a weird way to say that. If you were adding something in parentheses and then multiplying by something else, if you were doing 2.12 plus 3.15 multiplied by, I don't know, 5 plus 3. Kind of gonna work. This value would have three significant figures. This value here would just have one. Let's make this a little bit more exciting. When you added this, you would get eight. So when you multiplied it by 5.27, I don't know. Thank you. I don't usually do math on the fly. That value times this, you would trim this back to the just one sig fig. When you multiply them together, you would then have one sig fig. Yes? You would do the same. So you're asking if we did 2.12 times 3.15 plus 5 times 3.25. Oh my god, where's the calculator? Oops. 2.15 times 3.15. So this value would get you six point six seven eight, which you would trim back to three six figs, so you would get six point six nine plus this one would give you sixteen point two five. This is falling apart rapidly. So then you would get twenty, have one six fig. So then you would add these together and 
And so this value here, so your final answer will have 30. Yeah, that's my question. Um, I think it would be 30 because when you add these together, you would get 26. 0.69, you can only have one sixes. I think it would have to be 30. There is one calculation in this class where it gets that complicated, and I'm pretty much going to show you how to do it. And if you follow those steps, you'll get it right in Alex. The rest of the time, we don't tend to do a whole lot of that. We add up some masses, and then we multiply with that, and we don't worry about it. But that's about the only time. And you can, if you, I don't know, play on the internet and there's all those like, what is the value of this equation? You can use PEMDAS or whatever that is. We're not going to do a lot of that because I find it super annoying. So, but you can basically just step through it that way. And that's how it should work. Good, good hard question, but a great question. Any other questions? Yes. So, it's how many numbers it is from the So, in addition, so addition is controlled by the number of places after the decimal point. So, in addition and subtraction, the number of sig figs can vary wildly is kind of an overstatement. But if you had 7.3 plus 8.2... That gives you 15.5. So you took two sig figs plus two sig figs, and now you've got three sig figs. It feels like we should chop that back to 15. It turns out that we don't because the significant figures are how many places are after the decimal point. So you can change the number of significant figures if you were to subtract these as well, which we're not going to do because that would not work as well. But if you had 15 and you subtracted 7, you went from two sig figs to one. You don't need to make up another one. These are good questions. Any other questions? So dimensional analysis. So for the rest of class today and at the very beginning of Monday, we're going to think about how to convert a value to another value using dimensional analysis. Shortly, in chapter 3, we're going to start doing this with chemical ideas. Grams, moles, other types of conversions along those lines, molarity. In order to get there, we're going to talk about dimensional analysis in terms of meters per second to miles per hour. That's not really a relevant calculation after chapter 3. So I'm going to teach it to you using concepts we know and like, and then we're going to be able to use that information elsewhere. So these types of calculations aren't really used a lot after this. So one, conversion factors are going to come on your equation sheet. You don't need to memorize. I will tell you the only one that you are required to know. You probably already know it. Otherwise, I will provide it for you. If I don't, you will raise your hand and ask me, and I'll tell you. So dimensional analysis is going to allow us to take our given units and convert them into our wanted units. So as you see in this example, right under the how many centimeters are in eight and a half inches, it tells you that one inch equals 2.54 centimeters. It may not be exactly like this on the mini exam. You might have to go look at a table of like conversion factors, but I'm going to give you a conversion factor. So in order to set this up, we're going to take our 8.50 inches in one inch. There are 2.54 centimeters. I will 
almost always write out all of my units. And then I will cancel them out. If you include your units and you make a mistake, it's easier for me to see what you did wrong. If you just plop a bunch of numbers in a row and you make a mistake, I will have a harder time giving you as much partial credit as if you show all of your work. So I'll we'll cancel these out. We will multiply 8.5 times 2.54 and get 21.6 centimeters. So this is how you would use a conversion factor. This value would be provided. So typically they're provided with an equal sign in the middle, which means you could write it 2.54 centimeters and one inch, or one inch is 2.54 centimeters. These are both the same. You do need to make sure that you are canceling out what you're shooting, like looking to do in the problem. So if you have a mass of 115 pounds, what is your mass in grain? This is going to be quite similar to the last one that we did. So we're going to take our mass of 115 pounds. We are provided a conversion factor in pounds to grams. So one pound, 453.6 grams. So how many significant figures should be in our answer? Three. So in this case, it's important to note that the conversion factors cannot control how many sig figs your answer has. So if both of these had only two sig figs, the problem, your solution should still have three because of what came out of the question. So in this case, our answer is 5.22 times 10 to the fourth grams. Questions? So these are relatively simple. We're taking a component and using one conversion factor to get to something else. So sometimes we're going to need to use more than one. So I like to think about this as there's more than one way to get somewhere. If you need to go to Gainesville, you can drive south out of the city, take some back roads, wind around, I don't know what any of the roads are around here, and you can get to Gainesville. Or you could drive all the way to Miami and then come back and end up in Gainesville. Now, many of you are like, what a waste of your life, lady. Why would you, why would you do that? I don't know. Maybe you wanted to go eat dinner in Miami first. Hard to say. The point is, you got to Gainesville. You just took the long way around. You took the scenic tour. You, I don't know. Conversion factors are somewhat independent. You can choose different ones than I use. You can set them up in a different order. You should ultimately still get to the same answer. I can maybe set it up in three and you set it up in 10 you run the risk of like making some weird converting back and forth of things, but you can run a conversion factor in multiple different ways and still get to the same answer. So the question is, should you be careful about taking a lot of extra detours? You can end up slightly off. Now, Alex will have a meltdown. Dr. Malcolm will be like, oh, yeah, you got the right answer. You took five extra steps. Maybe the answer was 22.9, and you got 22.7. But I can see that you did all the right work. Congratulations, you're getting full credit. Because for me, that's what's important. When we start using cubing of things, 
maybe obviously or not obviously, once you use the power of anything, it's going to do weird mathy things. So you can get to where your value is 18 and ours is more like 15. It shouldn't be that off. You could. The only downside is if they give it to you in like length, width, times height, and then you need to convert into cubic or convert through that way. We have an example for that in a minute. So as long as you get there, I'm not overly picky about how you do that. So one way to think about that is to look at we're going to do this one instead. Because this uses a little bit more and we're a little bit close on time. So the average speed of a nitrogen atom in air at 25 degrees Celsius is 515 meters per second. How fast is the atom going in miles per hour? So in this case, we have 515 meters per second. And it gives us a conversion factor. So we have our 515 meters in one second. I'm going to convert the meters first because it's on top and that's how I think. You can convert the seconds first. There are about seven different ways you can do this calculation. I will talk you through two. So the first thing I'm going to do is convert. So there are 1,000 meters and one kilometer. This value comes from that table you need to memorize. There is one kilometer. Nope. There's 1.6093 kilometers in one mile. So we've converted meters to miles. The other part is to convert seconds to hours. This is the conversion I'm not giving you. Hopefully, at this joint point in our lives, we know that there are 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour. There is a clock. It's behind the thing. If you get, frankly, if you're like, oh my god, I don't know, just raise your hand. I'll help you. Like, this is not how we want to lose any moments. So there are 60 seconds in one minute, and there are 60 minutes in one hour. You are more than welcome to do that there are 3,600 seconds in an hour. I struggle with that number, so I just do it twice. From here, you have to plug it in your calculator. You can do any number of ways to do that. You can multiply everything on the top, multiply everything by the bottom, divide those two numbers. You can basically plug it in as you go, get the answer. The other way you could have done this calculation is to separate your two conversions and then divide the numbers at the end. You should get roughly the same answer at the end. Roughly is probably an overstatement, but you should get 1.15 times 10 to the third miles per hour. Questions? <clears throat> Before you arrive back on Monday, I would like you to have attempted this calculation. In the notes, you can take a picture. You do not need to, you're not going to turn it in. I'm just going to start. We're basically going to launch into this one. So it will help you get better at practicing to do this. Do not forget to sign up for Alex. Your objectives are due Monday night. Nope, Saturday night and Monday night. If you have questions, I am happy to answer those. Otherwise, I will see you on Monday. The, they are all available.